Now let's take a close look at a typical rotor. Moving from the front end to the rear, we see first the thrust collar which bears against the thrust pads during operation. Just ahead of this there is the portion of the shaft which sits in the journal bearing. This area should be perfectly smooth with no indentations or marks. Moving further along we come to the gland seals which are needed to reduce steam leakage along the shaft. We'll be talking about this arrangement in more detail later. We now come to the series of wheels or discs as they are known which extend along the length of the shaft. Blades are fitted all around the periphery of the discs and are held firmly in place at the roots. On many machines further support is provided by fitting rings or shrouds around the outside of the blading. Note the much larger size of the low pressure blades in order to handle the increased volume of steam at this end. Now continuing our examination along the length of the rotor, we come to the low pressure end gland seal. This is at the interface between the casing and the rotor. Just on the outside of the casing is fitted the low pressure end journal bearing. At the very end of the shaft we find the coupling which is used to join the turbine and generator rotors. In addition, at this end of the shaft, we will often find a large gear drive which engages with the turning gear. As we'll see later, the turning gear allows us to rotate the rotor at very low speed, say 1 RPM, without having steam pass through the machine. This is used during shutdown to ensure even cooling and so prevent distortion of the rotor. More about this later. In earlier machines, the discs are shrunk onto the rotor shaft. A problem with this type of construction is that in some cases steam may leak along the shaft and cause distortion due to differential heating as well as a loss of efficiency. To overcome this problem in modern turbines the discs and the shaft are forged in one piece and then machined. Yet another method of building up the rotor is by welding discs together and so eliminating the shaft. Now remember that in between each disc and associated blades we have to fit the stationary blades. Let's see how these are held in place. The first time we examine a turbine we might imagine that these stationary blades could be fixed to the outer casing to line up with the moving blades like this. But we do have a problem with this arrangement. What is there to stop the steam passing around the blade instead of through it? In order to prevent this, a shield known as a diaphragm is constructed extending all the way from the inner diameter of the stationary blade down to the shaft, leaving a small clearance to allow rotation. In practice, the stationary blades are inserted into the diaphragm like this, and the diaphragm itself is fixed into the turbine casing. When diaphragms are removed during maintenance periods, they look like this. And here is a view of the bottom half of the turbine casing with the diaphragms in place. The diaphragms are sized to leave a small inside clearance to allow the shaft to rotate. Seal strips are fitted at this location to prevent steam leakage. After all, we want all steam to pass through the blading, not around it. And we'll be talking about steam seals later. When the turbine is assembled, the rotor must be very carefully lowered into place so that the discs fit perfectly between the respective diaphragms. Once the rotor is in place, the axial clearance can be adjusted and finally fixed in place at the thrust bearing. Similarly, the journal bearings must be adjusted to provide correct alignment with the generator rotor. When all adjustments are complete, the top half of the casing, which is a mirror image of the bottom part, is very carefully lowered into place and finally bolted down. The exterior of the turbine casing must be very well insulated to prevent heat loss. With temperatures at the high pressure end in the region of 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, we could suffer a considerable loss of efficiency as well as an uncomfortable turbine room if the insulation was inadequate. Now in this segment we've looked at general features of turbine construction. Using this information as a guide 
Make sure that you check and learn the structural features of your own turbines. At this point, it's time for a break, so please switch off the tape now and review this material in your workbook.